send an email to Enrique and Luis just to that they know who is going to who is attending to the lectures. And I wanted to make a, another announcement. It's about a talk by Jan Philippe Solove, which is the president of the European Mathematical Society, and is giving a, uh, going to give a talk. Uh, not next week, but the week after, on Wednesday, 24th. Um, it will be at 11.30, Salon de Grados. Uh, you will see, I mean, by email announcement, but I wanted to give you, and he will give also two other talks, but it will be in San Sebastian at DPC, and a popular talk in San Telmo Museum, or again in, in San Sebastian. So this would be, so he will give a, a talk on 25th, uh, so this is a popular talk in Saint Elmo Museum, Donastia. And then the IPC, it's on the morning, it's a Friday, so it's a 26, fr Friday, Friday morning. And it will be a different topic. So this is on dilute quantum gas, and the other one is on mathematics of, if I remember well, mathematics of the um, periodic table. You know, periodic table, and then there is, uh, and then he is analyzing uh, ground state and so on about about this. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's completely different topics uh, that he will speak about hmm? okay. on, on Friday, on Friday. So, okay. Okay, so I need to... Thank you. Okay, so let me add that Dan Philippe is a super good, <laughs> super good speaker, so I encourage you to go. I mean, so. <laughs> uh, so Okay, so let's uh, 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 recap a bit where we where we are. So essentially, we uh, are interested on some Hamiltonians of of this form, some local Hamiltonians, and in particular, in understand. Uh, the spectral gap. And we commented yesterday that, in particular, from this, we can talk about gaps of local Limbladians, so Limbladians of similar form. Uh, because there is a reduction, there is a reduction by Itayarat and Corabolitos, um, showing that. And then, um, okay, then from here, there are some techniques to upgrade to MLSI constants in some cases, so, so far only, constants for L. And this gives very good bounds on the convergence time of these Limbladians, and this has effects or has some, uh, okay, some implications on um, lifetime of quantum memories, essentially how fast the noise destroys your quantum information, or uh, for the efficiency of dissipative quantum computation, as I said, yesterday, uh, dissipative quantum computation is to interact, uh, so, so to, to engineer a Limbladian of this form, let it evolve, and the fixed point of the Limbladian encodes the solutions to your problem. So essentially, how fast this converges is just exactly the time the algorithm takes. Okay, so, uh, this is a big problem, okay, all these are big problems, but in particular for this upgrade we have so far very few techniques uh, uh, and work only in very particular cases. So this is uh, an important problem, uh, but I will probably not have time to talk about this, if so very few, but okay, at the very end. So, I said, yes. 
What do you mean, sorry? Well, I guess at the end of the day, you want to have. Um, so MSI, what, what was it? I mean, can can so MSI have... gives you a bound on the time on the convergence times so of the invariant. A bound. Do you yes. have uh, effective ways of computing this bound? Or yeah, exactly. This is this is what, yes. This is what we yes. Okay, it's a very good question indeed. Uh, yes, but of course, based on properties of. Okay, uh, for instance, so so the only cases we, we know how to deal so far are somehow associated to this part um, and are exactly for thermal noise coming for very particular uh, Hamiltonians, mm -hmm. which have commuting terms. Uh, in that case, yes, we, we do have bounds that depend only on the temperature. Yes. yes. Uh, and for more general cases, essentially we have no techniques. Or so that's 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 a bit. Uh, okay, so still, just with the gap, we have already some bounds uh, because we know. I saw you yesterday that a bound on the gap gives immediately a, a gap on the MLSI, even if it's not the best one. Okay, so still this gives already bounds. Okay, but but the ones this upgrade improves these bounds exponentially. So okay, the bounds in the convergence times exponential. Okay, so that's <laughs> so already this. Already, this gives information about this and that, just making this implication the weakest, so in the trivial one, in which, as I said, so you just one can bound the MLSI by the gap, paying a price, uh, which in many cases is only polynomial in the size of the system. Okay, so, so essentially, this boils down to understand this question. Um, yes. yes. Having a gap in the Hamiltonian allows you to, to build a Liouvillian such as a fixed point. No, 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 no. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. Yeah. All this, all this arose. I want to understand. No, no, no. Sorry, sorry. No, no. Uh, what I mean is that solving this problem implies solving this problem. Okay. And then from this problem, we get that via the bounds on the MLSI coming from the gap. There are direct bounds that they're already known, I, I told you yesterday, but one can improve a lot of those bounds in some cases. That's this upgrade part. Okay? Uh, this is what I mean. So yeah, what this, there is a reduction. Whenever we have a Limbladian, which is local, and we have quantum detail balance, under some mild conditions, uh, one can, okay, because it's quantum detail balance, it's self-adjoint in some Hilbert space, but in this Hilbert space, you have somehow to to uh, it's a distorted Hilbert space, and then you may lose locality. And then with Ayrat and company, last year showed that under some mild conditions, okay, there are always some conditions, uh, one can recover locality here. And then, so that's, so therefore, the problem reduces to the problem of the gap of a local Hamiltonian. So that's, that's so the arrow always means that solving this implies solving that, no, not the opposite. So given a Liouvillian, you construct a Hamiltonian, and then you solve that Hamiltonian. Okay. And this is exactly what we will do. Okay. Yeah. It is, yes. Uh, I will show you in a second that probably this, this is what I, I will exactly tell now. <laughs> uh, the fact that we have a local Hamiltonian imposes a lot of restrictions, interesting ones, on the ground state. In particular, that be well approximated by tensor networks. That's, that's, that's the topic of today. Okay, so that's so. So this is exactly the question. So now, um, if we have some objects like that, then how do uh, uh, their ground states look like? Can we get approximations of them? Any other nice property? <laughs> OK, so that's, that's the. We already saw yesterday, in general, this, this problem is hard. So in general, this problem is, in general, is undecidable. 
even in 1D. So of course, Uh, okay, what I mean, deciding that. Deciding the spectral graph. Even in 1D. So sometimes, so what we will do is to assume that we have a spectral graph, okay? And then see what happens. Now, how to check that is a different question, and we'll show in particular cases how to prove that. But in general, that's hard. Okay, so, so let's, let's start with this any other nice property. Uh, it's something that uh, emerged yesterday uh, uh, during dinner. Uh, so, so one nice thing is that having a spectral gap or having an MLSI constant for an Inbladian, okay, having an MLSI constant for the Inbladian without any extra hypothesis, uh, for the gap you need some other hypothesis, but this implies that the Hamiltonian or the Inbladian are stable. And this is a very relevant question. So essentially, so for instance, stability. So I say the stability is without any extra hypothesis for MLSI Limbladians. And for the gap, we need some extra hypothesis, which is what is called topological order. That I will only comment briefly later. But stability is a very strong notion of stability. So stability means that if instead of having h, we have h prime, which is h plus, or let's say it's the same, but now we perturb this by some noise, say some epsilon, another kappa. So we, instead of the local interaction being exactly the ones we want, are close to them, but, but this happens in any local interaction, okay? So that's important. So, uh, and this is something realistic because in the end, you never have a perfect knowledge of your system, of the interactions of your system, and there was some uncertainty. So, but this is an extensive perturbation because I am perturbing every, any term independently. So the, the total perturbation is the sum of all these things and the norm of the perturbation grows with the system size. So this is not a, this is totally out of perturbation theory. Okay, so, but still, H prime has similar properties as H. So in the sense that it, it has a spectral gap, so the gap is kept, and okay, essentially one can uh, um, deform the ground state from one to the other in a smooth way. But essentially, the gap is kept at least. Okay, so the gap is kept. That's essentially similar properties, I would say. Physically, we say that it's in the same phase. Okay, so, so essentially, there is an analytic way to deform the one ground state into the other in something which is called the, uh, okay, the uh, quasi-adiabatic continuation result. So. Uh, and the gap is preserved, and okay, there are many nice results. So, there is a so this is a stable under this type of perturbations. Uh, and the same uh, for Limbladians, okay? So, as H. Good. So, so, that's a very nice property, and that's desirable. Okay, so, so let's focus on this. And this is very important because it, for many of the problems we are interested here, this is the object of interest. For instance, in this reduction from Limbladians to Hamiltonians, the fixed point of the Limbladian corresponds to the ground state of the Hamiltonian. Okay, so essentially, in other models of computation, like um, adiabatic quantum computation, in adiabatic quantum computation, the solution of the problem is the ground state of a particular Hamiltonian. So essentially, this is what we care about. So, so then this goes to what is called the area law conjecture. Okay. 
and I will state the conjecture in a rather vague way, and I will tell you what is known rigorously about the conjecture. And, okay, the rest is simply not known. It's a conjecture, okay? But there are many things known about that. So the other conjecture is the following. Okay, so take a system, take divided in two regions, A and B, which are reasonably nice regions. I mean, don't, don't take fractals as regions, okay? So like regions like that, okay? Um, and then take psi, the ground state of a gapped of H, okay? Where H must be gap local, okay? This, this setup. And of course, we should assume that the ground state is essentially is unique or maybe there is some finite degeneracy, okay? But there are some hypotheses on, on the number of ground states that H can have to avoid trivial cases. Okay, so, but there, again, this is part of the conjecture to optimize that. But for instance, assume it's a unique ground state to simplify. In that case, the conjecture is, is, is believed. So, and now, of course, now we can uh, divide the vertices, so we are in a lattice. Okay. And there are some vertices in A, some vertices in B. And we can see this, we can define the Hilbert space of A as the tensor product of all vertices in A of the Hilbert spaces of the vertices. And the Hilbert space in B as the tensor product of all um, vertices in B of HB. Okay? And then we can see Psi as a bipartite state in the tensor product of HA tensor HB, which is the total Hilbert space. No? So total Hilbert space of the lattice is simply HA tensor HB. Okay? So this is now bipartite state. And then what they would do is to measure the entanglement of this state. For that one is to decide which is the entanglement measure you use. But for pure bipartite states, there is a unique entanglement measure, which is the entanglement, what is called entanglement entropy. So if you ask for a measure to have reasonable properties for entanglement, for bipartite pure states, there is a unique measure, which is the entanglement entropy. So the, the capital letters measure of entanglement. So if it's mixed or tripartite, there are many, but for bipartite pure, there's only one, the entanglement measure, which is called the entropy of entanglement. It's called the entropy of entanglement. Entanglement is, is simply the entropy of the reduced density matrix of A, which is equal to the reduced density matrix of B, by the way. Okay? Okay, so I take this state, I consider, so what I'm doing here is I take Psi AB, but now I see really as a, real, as a state, so it's Psi Psi, okay, and I, this is rho AB. And now I take the reduced density <laughs> matrix, the reduced state, as I told you yesterday, by tracing one of the two systems. If I trace system B, this is row A. If I trace system A, this is row B. The entropy of both states is the same because this state is pure. This happens always. It's very easy to do. Okay, so that's, that's the object. Okay, and I remember that this is minus the trace of row log row. Okay. Okay. So then what happens? Well, that's the conjecture, conjecture, the area law conjecture is that this scales as much as the border, the area of A. So it's called area because we, we think in 3D if you want, and the interior is the volume, and this is the area, okay, it's the surface. 
And now the surface of A, you can see as the number of vertices in E, in A, which are part of an interaction interaction uh, involving B involving also B. So in, for instance, in this interaction HP, so something is in the border of A, for instance, because there is one interaction that in, involves this, ver this vertex and involves also a vertex in B, for instance, this placket. No? So these are the elements considered in the border of A. Okay, so vertices in A, which are part of an interaction involving B, okay, vertices in B. For instance, this, this is in the interior. In principle, I think it could have. Uh, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah, yes, I'm assuming, yeah, yeah. This is what I mean, I don't have fractals. So, so, this is what, so the hypothesis on this being sufficiently nice. Yeah, this is what they said, to avoid fractals and these things. So that really, there's a no, clear notion of of interior, oh sorry, of, of, of uh, interior and boundary, which of course the boundary should be much smaller than the interior. So there is that the boundary scales with L and the interior with L square, no? So it's a bit the, the, the this is the philosophy. <laughs> Okay, so that's that. This question, the same, you could have things inside. The problem is you really want to know how they scale to increase the problem. Of course, and this is why... If you have holes inside, then how you make that also thermodynamic, that, that would be yes. iffy. But for instance, if you have a band... Uh, a what? A, a band. A band. That's something that uh, could make sense. Uh, yes. But having a hole, in a sense, that would be going out because the hole is going to be microscopic with respect to the outside. Yeah, yeah but this is why it probably doesn't... So because this is an order, okay? So you can put prefactors here. So you can sort this in the prefactors. And again, it's a scaling thing. Scaling means with the size of A. Uh, yeah, so but then whatever is inside is also important to the boundary, right? Like if you have a disk, you yes. can check out the ball inside. The size, the size of the area of the boundary is in. Yes. Yeah, it's a huge contribution from the inside part. Yeah. Okay. Yes, yeah, but it's still a behavior. But the asymptotic behavior is the same. I, I don't see the difference. I don't see the difference. Why? why? It's empty there. Oh, the, what the important thing is that this really grows. <laughs> so that's the important thing. Because the size of the boundary of this and of that is the same size. So it doesn't change anything. That's why I gave the example of the band, because you can also map the band to the annulus, essentially. So it's exactly the same thing. But again, but I mean, if you want, I mean, it's not that important. No, no, if, if you can say, okay, let's take simply connected regions and do the conjecture for simply connected regions, it's still open. That's totally okay. I mean, it's no need to complicate the thing. Okay, so that's. Uh, I mean, annulus play a role, for instance, you have topological order, it's very relevant, but still in those examples, the contribution extra to the annulus is constant, so it doesn't, doesn't kill this thing. So, but I mean, let's do simply connected regions, nice boundaries, and that's it. Pure state, because when pure states, pure states, pure states. Yes. <laughs> okay, you know, I can tell you, for instance, there is an area law, uh, which is not a conjecture for for MLSI Limbladians that we proved like almost 10 years ago. And the same is true for the fixed points of MLSI Limbladians. But um, now these things are mixed in general. And now it's the, it's, uh, the area law is for the mutual information. The mutual information coincides with the entropy up to a factor of two for pure states. So it's the same thing. So then the area law for mixed states, which is the context here, is for the mutual information. No, it's about no, no. It's, it's simply no, no. It's simply because the, it's a measure of entanglement. It's the entanglement with, and then I will show in a second that indeed, if we go to tensor networks that captures this area law, uh, then one can make a conjecture that ground states are well approximated by tensor networks, 
and this is a very different type of, of conjecture. It plays a role in the, the when you are saying that the entanglement measure, yeah, uh, the only easy. one is uh, yeah, yeah. because if you have to say it's not the only one, it's not the one. Exactly. MLSI, Limbladians, fixed points. MLSI Limbladians. Uh, yeah, satisfy. Uh, that the mutual information of A, B in the fixed point is of the boundary of A. And that's the mutual information that is, I, I, I introduced it yesterday, is rho infinity A plus rho infinity B minus rho infinity AB which is the same as relative entropy of rho infinity AB, rho infinity A tends to rho infinity B. Okay, so that's, that's the... And then, then, and then it's clear that if you have a pure state, this is zero, this is equal to that, so the mutual information is twice that. So it's the general, generalization of that. But it's true for mixed states, there are many entanglement measures, in particular the mutual information measures also classical correlations, not only entanglement. Uh, so, but, uh. but you chose, chose a state that was a ground state of the Yeah, exactly. The property of the entanglement must be local. Okay. Starting, you have a ground state of the entanglement. Oh, yeah, and then the other state of the entanglement, like that. This, this is important. <laughs> like with these properties. So it's crucial that it's local and it's gap. No, no, definitely it's wrong. Indeed, indeed, this is a pretty strong hypothesis. If you take the set of all states in H, I can take all of them, uh, if you count the volume, essentially all of, essentially all of them in volume, will feel volume low, so this grows with the volume. So this is a super small family state. So you take a random state. So this is a very strong condition, very strong indeed. So that's, that's a good question because it's important that this, uh, this is why this is small corner. So this is the big Hilbert space and this small corner is this area low states. So that's <coughs> essentially, Random states, essentially, um, with overwhelming probability, which probability? <coughs> uh, fulfill that uh, uh, S row A uh, is essentially grows with the volume. So essentially, area low states are very small. This is what is called is a, uh, the relevant corner of the big Hilbert space. Uh, it's relevant that this would be called ground states of gap Hamiltonians. This five state, dimension, right? Yeah. 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 The, the volume of, of yeah, you can plug this kind of thing doesn't matter. So, question um, I'm wondering whether even whether even even this zero measure uh, already, I don't know. Uh, I don't know measure? I mean, you can use some terms like generic rather than... No, maybe it's even set zero measure. Uh, not even just a small measure. Maybe it's even zero measure. 
Legendary. With method one, this is true. This is the key. Okay. For, the, for the case of tensor networks, which also, I mean, another, I will say in a second, another, another conjecture is that ground states of gap Hamiltonians are well approximated by tensor networks. Um, definitely tensor networks are zero measure because it's a, it's a manifold, it's a proper manifold, so it's definitely zero measure. Uh, so for the area law, I don't know, this I have to think because it's a bit bigger than the tensor networks, but still it's super small. <laughs> I don't know if it has interior or not, but it's super small in any case. Uh, I should know that, but okay. But okay, I, let, let's, but still, simply that this is very small, a small object. Okay, so, good. So, um, I can tell you what is known about the area law, but I prefer, and this is not, is well, it's proven in one dimension. Uh, in two dimension, it's proven up to a logarithmic factor but under extra hypothesis on the Hamiltonian, more than that. Uh, but okay. I prefer to go to the modified area law conjecture, which is tensor network approximation, because I think it's, it's, it's nicer, it's, it's more like uh, practical. So, so for that, let me introduce tensor networks. Um, okay, so let, let me try to let's let's try to find a family of states uh, fulfilling the area law. And so, let's take, uh, we are in a lattice. Now, let me put the sides very big. Um, okay, let me move, move over a couple of sides more here. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I mean, in this side, I will put more internal sites, and then I'm going to join <laughs> things like that, okay? So I will explain in a second what this thing is. <laughs> Etc. Okay. Almost done. Okay. So now each one of these objects. So this dot represents CD, uh, sorry, C capital D, C capital D, and this object represents what is called the maximal entangled state, one over the square root of D, sum from one to D, I tensor I. Okay? So this link represents this state. Essentially, this object is nothing but the tensor product in all edges of this state in each edge. Okay, nothing else. Okay, this is equal to that. Okay, there's a picture of that object. Okay, where well, of course, this is. So here, in each side now, 
each side. Now is CV tensor 4. Okay. Okay. And this goes in the back. This is tensor 3, tensor 2, but tensor 4, not the ones in the back. Okay. Well, because I need one CD for an entangled state between this and this, another CD for an entangled state between this and that, so this, and this is a tensor product. Okay. This is just. Okay. So this state has an area law. It's a single state. We'll modify it later. But that's, and it's very simple to see. So we take a region like that. This is A. We can see that we can write this state as the tensor product of all edges contained totally in A. And these edges are this, 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 and this, no? Of this state. Tensor, the edges containing B, which are this, no? This, 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 etc. No, all this. Tensor, the edges connecting, connecting A and B. Okay. And now, in the tensor, if I want to see this as a state, between a side, between a, a and B, as before. So the only terms that contribute to the entanglement are exactly these ones. Because this is just a tensor that lives entirely in A, a single tensor, with tensor with something else. So in the sum, I mean, the, if you want, Spectral decomposition of the radio density matrix, this, is, does, this does, does not enter, it's a separate tensor. The same for that. So the only thing that enters is this. It's the only thing. So it's very simple to see. Only that. But look that now the entanglement entropy of this object. Entanglement. Entropy of this object is simply the sum of the entanglement of those things, because it's elementary tensor. So it's just the sum of the entanglement of those things. So this, how many of those I have, I mean the boundary, times the entanglement of one of them, which is logarith logarithm of D. Okay, Again, it's, it's just the, the sum because the entanglement entropy is, is additive. No? You have a tensor product, the, the entanglement sums, because it's the entropy. There's a logarithm there, no? So, so, uh, so essentially, it's the sum of the entanglement of these objects. These objects have entanglement log D, all of them. And they have boundary of A of them, because it's exactly the number of edges connecting A and B. So the entanglement is that. And these two do not contribute to the entanglement between A and B because this lives entirely on A, the other lives entirely on B, and they are independent tensors. Okay? So that's, that's how it is. So, so then the entanglement of this object is exactly that in this case, and therefore grows with the boundary. Okay? Okay, so, so that, that's... The, the canonical example, and then it's easy to see that now I can, if instead of doing this, I apply in each side a linear operator in each side, the entanglement cannot grow. And the reason is that essentially the decomposition will be the same. The thing is that here I will have other states or other things, but, but the Smith rank of this object will be the same 
will be bounded by will be the same as this one, and this is the maximal entanglement for that Smith rank. So it's not difficult to see, simply by, by seeing which is the, the rank of the review density matrix of A, which is the Smith rank of that object. Uh, so essentially, if we apply, so the, the remark is, remark is that, if we apply um, if we apply um, at each vertex an operator AB, which goes from CD tensor 4 to CD, and then the, the final state, which is called a PEPS, I will explain now the, not the, the name, uh, will be the tensor in all vertices of AB applied to the tensor in all edges, so this is vertices, edges of phi D, normalized, because this in principle is not normalized, normalized. So this object fulfills also that the um, entropy, so that the review density matrix of row A is O. Uh, indeed, is bounded by, in this case, the same. is bounded by log D times the value of A, same bound. The reason essentially what I'm doing here is to bound the rank of, of that matrix. That's what I mean. And showing that the rank of that matrix is bounded by, so the rank of row A, this is indeed what I'm doing here, but maybe I didn't do it specifically, is bounded by um, uh, D to the power boundary of A. And now with matrices, with the states uh, having that rank, the entropy, the maximal possible entropy is this one, which is attained exactly by that case. Because you maximize the entropy if all eigenvalues are equal. And that's, that's, that's what happens there. Ah, sorry, sorry, this, I, uh, thank you, thank you. Peps, Peps is projected entangled pair states, which is this picture. Projected entangled pair state. This, this means because these are, um, and so this is called uh, entangled pair, and then we, we create a state made of entangled pairs, which is this state. And then we do a linear projection from this big space into a smaller one, which is the physical damage. And this is why the name. Okay. Okay. And this is a family of tensor networks that is the one that is relevant for this problem. So this is a family of tensor networks. And I will now explain a bit of, of that. Yes? Uh, in the picture, there is no physical uh, in the Here, okay, because in, in this picture, here, this D is, is D to the 4. So, the, and this is the identity. Okay, so, this is what I did here. Here, I simply consider this object. And now, each side which is CD, if you want, C small d, was that. And now I allow myself to do a linear map. And this is what they call a PEPS. Okay, so the PEPS is uniquely defined 
by this set of linear maps. Because this is always the same. Because it should be a, a virtual edge of virtual images, no? Yes. And the physical one now is. Uh, Wait a second. I will go to this set of network uh, you want. Diag diag diagrammatic notation right now. Okay. And maybe then it's clear that what you are asking. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So, any other question? Okay. Okay. So, okay. So, in particular, this is a guess. So we are just guessing a family of states which fulfill the area law. But we, we, this could be, in general, a very bad guess, in the sense that may, maybe, OK, this is just a subfamily having the area law, but there are many other things having the area law. And this has nothing to do with what we were caring, which is that we approximate well ground states of Hamiltonians. OK, so, but no, this was a very good guess. By the way, this was, this, perhaps these were introduced by Ignacio Zirac and Fran Festrete in 2004 in, in, in general dimensions, but in one dimension um, uh, they have a different name and they were introduced long before. Uh, not with this picture, but with a different picture which is totally equivalent. Uh, so let me erase this. So in 1D, the PEPs are called matrix product states. States, MPS. And they were introduced in 1992 into papers. Uh, the paper in which the, the numerical al uh, algorithm DMRG was introduced by Stephen White. And then uh, the paper, which finitely correlated states, finitely correlated states. By Fannes, Nachtergale, and Werner. <laughs> Werner. Uh, okay, and this is kind of the origin of the 1D case. A any question? No. no. Okay. Oh, this is a bit the, the history. Of course, the, there are precursors of that, like the AKLT model by Alfred Kennedy Leap and Tasaki, which was the first example of things like that. So the early, I forgot, 88 maybe or 87, the AKLT paper, so Afflet model, both in 1D and in 2D. So there are concrete examples of apps <coughs> in 1D and 2D. So Affleck, Kennedy, Leap, and Tasaki. It's kind of the first. So, okay, there are precursors, but okay, essentially that's the origin. Okay, so mm, let me just state that this was a good guess. Uh, essentially, all right, theorem, but with quotation mark for, because this is many theorems with some hypotheses that I will summarize later, but the theorem is that the set of PEPs is approximately equal up to some epsilon that one can bound depending on things like the bond dimension, things that I will define in a second, the set of ground states of local gap Hamiltonians. Uh, or if you want, this or call is the area law conjecture versus two version two, area law conjecture conjecture 
version 2. And again, I will state then which is exactly known about this conjecture. And the thing is that is epsilon scales nicely with, or essentially, um, okay, so essentially the important, the important, uh, um, say the important uh, quantity uh, for this tensor network is what is called the bond dimension, and the bond dimension is D, this D here. This, this, this D, this D, this D, etc. This is called the bond dimension. And essentially, this tells you how complex the tensor network is because, I mean, the information you need to provide to give your tensor network, to give your PEPs, is this set of, of linear maps. So then how much information you have to give? You have to give one of those per vertex. If you have translation invariance, maybe it's the same in all vertices. And now, and now this is just a linear map from here to here. So essentially, I mean, this is, I mean, the, 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 the dimension of that, of that uh, set is uh, capital D to the four times small d. Small d is the physical dimension. So that's something that is part of the, of the, of the system. Essentially, then, the, the amount of information you have to give is d to the 4. So the dimension is d to the 4 times the size of the system. So essentially, this capital D must scale at most polynomially with the size of the system, because otherwise uh, you don't have resources to store your tensor network or play with it or whatever. Okay? So essentially, what we are caring is to prove results that tells you that if you want to have an approximation to the ground state with a PEPS up to error epsilon, then the bond dimension D should be scaled at most polynomially with the system size and with the inverse of the error, the type of things we want, so that things are efficient. Okay, so that, that's the goal. Okay. Uh, before going into that, I, I will need to, to do the more tensor network standard uh, picture of this, which is probably equivalent of that, uh, what is called the graphical notation for tensor networks, and maybe this is answering now I mean, your question before. I simply just the following. So now, so, so each PEPS is given by this set of ABs. No? linear maps from here to here. Uh, of course, by the way, I mean, the particular lattice or graph in which this is defined is totally irrelevant. As you see, one can do exactly the same for any graph. Okay, so it's not, but okay. Um, of course, yes, this is the same. I mean, one can equally see this as an element in here, okay? So that's simply, no, because this is an object which has four input indices and one output index, but essentially the number of indices is, is five, and then they can write it like that, okay? So this is simply you want the coefficients associated to the linear map. So now what I do is I'm going to do a graphical notation. So this is kind of same as thinking like that. So now I can now write a, a, a blob and call here AV. And I'm going to um, take another color, which is better than green. Blue. Or no, this one. This one. Yes. Okay, so, and then I will do this, okay? So, this is simply, this means that then I, it's a graphical notation now, which is very useful 
and now identify any tensor with a blob with the number of legs equal to the number of tensor factors um, and now this the, the purple one is associated to the CD and then the other four to the other CDs This is just a graphical notation, okay? And then you can see this simply just as EV is, if you want, in coefficients, this is just a V, I, and then J, or alpha, beta, F, gamma, delta, for I from 1 to D, and alpha, beta, gamma, delta, from 1 to D, no? if I expand this in the computational basis. Okay, so it's just a sequence of, like a, a tensor, no? it's a generalized matrix, instead of having two coefficients, we have many. Okay? And then simply one of the legs correspond to one of these indices, nothing else. Uh, and now we have two operations I can do with these pictures. Two operations. One is um, juxtaposition, which means tensor product. For instance, if I have two of these things. This is AB1 and this is AB2. This means AB1 tensor AB2. Okay. And therefore, this belongs to CD4, CD. Tensor 4, tensor CD, sorry, CD, tensor CD4, tensor CD. Okay. okay, this belongs to that. Okay, it's just that. Okay, that's easy. And then the second is what is called tensor contraction. which is, uh, we correspond to joining legs. Now I have, let me do it here. Oh. I have already this these two so I'm in the in the setup and now I join these two legs. I do that. Okay. And now this means imp so this we implement in the involved in the two involved involved tensor factors the map the delta map Okay, so simply in this tensor, so we take, there is one CD associated to it, to this leg here, sorry, in white. There is one CD associated to this leg in this other one. In these two CDs, I implement that. Okay? So now this leaves where? 
So this object now lives in CV tensor 3 because only these three survive because these two CD goes to C, so they disappear. Tensor CD, tensor CD3, tensor CD. Okay? This is what I do. So now. <coughs> Any questions about this? This is just a graphical notation. There's nothing else. So, so now it's very, very, very simple. Uh, is the exactly, 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 exactly. So what I'm going to say is that that doing this is exactly the same as we did before, basically. because because exactly this maximally entangled state, what Enrique said, which is, is of course totally right. So this maximal entangled state we had before exactly implement this map, if you want. This is this map. Only, this, only the diagonal survives, which is actually what is happening. So then with that, it's not difficult to see uh, that I can write the peps with this notation as follows. So the previous peps with this graphical notation is the following. I don't know how many, how big I, I wrote it. Let's do four by four. And now there is an extra index that I put like that. Okay. Here. And these objects are these blobs here. These blobs are these objects here. Okay. And this lives in CD tensor okay, the, the size of the lattice. Okay. Only because look that all the capital D's disappear because all the capital D's belong to a leg that was joined. And like these two, they disappear. So all of them disappear. And in the end, the only things that remain are these C to the Ds, and there is one per blob. So, so it's an, an element in the physical space associated to this, to this lattice. Okay, so that's, and it's exactly the same as we did before. So it's the same, the same state is simply two pictures of the same object. Okay, but that's the standard tensor network notation for these peps. In the tensor network is anything that you can construct in a graph using rules one and two. This is a tensor network. Okay, so that's it. Okay. Um, any questions? Yes. Ah, no, 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 but okay, it's a very good question, it's a very good question, it's a very good question, thanks. Uh, so far, I, I have considered an independent map for each vertex, but in principle, I could also, for instance, uh, we can, this is a very good question indeed, thanks. I could also consider, if I have a lattice like this, I can consider a v the same, say a, for every vertex. Of course, for that, I need periodic boundary conditions because I need to have as many 
uh, legs in any blob. So of course, then I go from here to here, from here to here, from here to here, and so on and so forth. And the same like that. OK? And then, of course, I'm in a torus. Uh, and then this, this is a state which is the relational invariant. And then we get a translational invariant state. Relation invariant state. And then one expects that if you have a gap translational invariant Hamiltonian, the Granada state could should be able to should, you should be able to approximate it with a translational invariant TEPS, and that's true. So there's no, so you have translational invariant in the Hamiltonian, you can, without a lo loss of generality, assume the PEPS is translational invariant. And in particular, all the vertices, all the tensors in the vertices are the same. And the most concrete examples of tensor networks are like that, or PEPS, I would say, like that. Any other question? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, you need to uh, do this canonical form of the tensor. Mm -hmm. So you have to choose it left to right canonical. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with the periodic boundary condition? Uh, because then you cannot. Uh, like, it's a very good question, but, but there is a canonical form also for translational invariant MPS. Uh, I can give you references. Even for translational invariant PEPS, we call the minimal canonical form. It's a paper we put in the archive last year. The minimal canonical form, but this is for 2D. For 1D, it's a paper from 2006 it's called Matrix Product State Representations, and there you have the. But there is a review, maybe the best thing, there is a review uh, that Iraq. Xiu, uh, no, Pedro García, so myself, Xiuch, Norbert Xiuch, and Van Verstrete. Reviews of Modern Physics, uh, 2000 and, oh, sorry, 22, I think, uh, which is called essentially, I forgot, Proyectin Entangled Pair States, Symmetries, Theorems, and something like that, which essentially is, is very extensive review of all. Results at, that are known uh, essentially, uh, which are mathematically rigorous about tensor networks. It's not about numerics, it's just about the mathematics of tensor networks. And there you have everything up to that date. This minimal canonical form is posterior, so this is not there. But this is, yeah, there you have it. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so. So I said, I mean, we'll see in a second, I mean, PEPS is equal, approximately equal to the set of ground states. And indeed, this explains why numerical methods based on PEPS work extremely well. So essentially, if, it is if, the following idea, if the set of ground states is equal to the set of PEPS, then if I want to compute the ground state energy of a Hamiltonian, if I want to minimize the energy of a Hamiltonian among all possible states, this should be the same, approximately, to minimize in the set of PEPs. Well, because, of course, if the minimum is achieved there, that's it. So essentially, in order to solve the problem of finding the ground energy or an, an, an approximation of the ground state of a Hamiltonian, people try to solve that. And now PEPS is a manifold because it's just a set of tensors. Um, but the state that you construct for the tensor is nonlinear. And therefore, this is a nonlinear function that you have to optimize on the manifold. And this is indeed a manifold, an algebraic manifold of uh, states given by tensor networks. And this is, then there are several algorithms that people have been doing here uh, that work very well in practice. Uh, so, so this is the numerics 
which is variational algorithms. There are many algorithms, variational algorithms. Algorithms in the family of PEPs. Um, so far, there are no proofs of convergence of those algorithms except in 1D. So in 1D, there was a breakthrough in 1D by Tom Abidic. Eh, okay, let's put the Zeflan Dow, eh, Umes Bacirani, Tom Abidic. Uh, they come from quantum information theory. Uh, I think, I think Umes was a plenary speaker of ICM last year, indeed. Uh, and, and Toma was one of the persons behind this recent solution of the core embedding problem using quantum information ideas. So, so they are very smart people. So they showed in 1D uh, that uh, th there is a polynomial time algorithm that solves that problem. It's a polytime algorithm. Solving that. But this is only in 1D. Okay. Uh, as it usually happens, the algorithm that has polytime guaranteed convergence is not the, the one that works best in practice. <laughs> In practice, still the original algorithm of DMRG by White is, is the best. But this original White algorithm does not have guaranteed or co uh, convergence guarantees. But in principle, as the level of complexity theory, they show that the problem of finding the ground state, a ground state approximation of one dimensional gap Hamiltonian is a problem which is in P, polytime. Okay, they, this is what they showed. And I think it's a major result. That there is a gap. No, 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 no. This is part of the proof because, well, okay, it was already known. For one D, for one D was is known, but it was not already before. Uh, that I will show it in a second. That ground state of gap Hamiltonians are well approximated by mathematics for the states, and they simply found a way to find that approximation. Okay. Uh, as I said, yeah, the area law for 1D was, was proven. It's not this one. It's the original one of, of 1992. Okay, I mean, there has been, of course, a lot of improvements since then, but the, the idea is this. But I'm not an algorithm people, so I really don't know exactly. Uh, but you know, I mean, there have been, of course, modifications of that, but same philosophy. Uh, there are other algorithms that people use now, it seems also to. As far as it, the people told me, I don't know. I mean, they, they work pretty well based more on things like gradient descent and these things, but they still they also don't have guaranteed of convergence. Um, because as I said, this is in the end a nonlinear optimization problem over some particular uh, nonlinear functions, which are these for this family. So, but yeah, for 1D, it's very, it's very remarkable, but this can be done in polytime. For 2D and higher, this is a big open question. So, in the case, one has to be very careful that one is not solving, proving what, what, what you trace these things, that you are not solving P equal MP or these things, because many of the problems that can be encoded here are MP hard. So one has to be very careful that whatever you prove is not including P equal MP. So this is a sanity check always to, to, to do. Okay, but. But okay, that's that's the state of the art. Okay, so maybe any any question? If not, maybe I will give you an overview of what is known about this. Sure. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Now it's a very good question, and now indeed. People are using, okay, I, I think people like probably Roger Melko, Perim Perimeter and some others already used neural network methods 
uh, to simulate quantum systems, so to solve these type of things. And now, uh, of course, everyone is doing neural networks, so they are also doing neural networks for these things. Um, I don't know if in one, I mean, beating the MRG in 1D is very hard, so it behaves so well, I don't know, of course. But for 2D and other hard problems, probably people I'm sure they are using neural networks. But the same, I'm no guarantee, as far as I know, no guarantee of convergence in all these methods. So, uh, as I say, in 2D, there is not, not a clear winning method. And this is where they, or in 3D, and this, and there, of course, there are a lot of competing methods. And in 1D, I mean, it's really very difficult to beat the MRG. I mean, it behaves so well. But, uh, so, but, but again, I, I don't know the, the literature that well. To, uh, any, any other question? Uh, the review from 20, okay, 21, okay, whatever. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so, so let me then summarize more or less what is known about this equality. And now, to speed up, I will go to the, to the slides. Okay, I mean, it's important because we will need both, uh, indeed we will need both, um, that this equality, okay, as mathematicians, you have to prove an equality between sets, you have to prove one inclusion and the other inclusion, and both inclusions are interesting, okay? Uh, so we need to show, so we need to show this inclusion and the other inclusion. I don't remember which I put first. I think I put first this one. The set of PEPs is included in the set of ground state of gap Hamiltonians. Okay, so this means that for every object like that, we have to cook up a Hamiltonian that has this object as ground state. Gap and local. Sure, 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 sure. Uh, sure, I don't know if, uh, yeah. I wrote, when I wrote there the corner, it was local and gapped. Maybe when I wrote something, I forgot local. It's definitely local and gapped. They say gapped, local interacting Hamiltonians. Okay, that's that. Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely, of course, yes, yes, yes. Uh, okay, so, and then for the other is what I said before. And now we have any local interacting gap Hamiltonians, and we like to approximate the ground state by a PEPs. So, that's, that's, so two things are relevant for us. Okay, so, as I said, we will first show that every PEPs is the ground state of some local Hamiltonian, and we'll see in which case it's gapped or not, which is also a diff difficult question. And then the other, that the ground state of any local gap Hamiltonian can be well approximated by a PEPs. These are the two things. Oh, sorry. Let's start with that. So for that, given a PEPS, we have to construct a Hamiltonian associated to that PEPS. And this is called the parent Hamiltonian construction. Okay. Let me add that there are other constructions, uh, but somehow this is kind of the standard one. Okay, so, so we have our PEPS with our... Uh, um, Tensor diagrams, like the one exactly I have written in the blackboard, but a bit tilted, no, here. And now I take a region, R, which is this green region here. So in my torus, because I, I do periodic boundary conditions, I mean, for simplicity again, the same works without that, but let's do translation invariant, periodic boundary conditions, for simplicity, we take a region in the torus, which is just a, a, a simply connected region, like, like square. Okay, and now I define the following map, gamma R, which is a map that maps boundary conditions of that region to states that live in that region. Okay, so let me... So now we have to go back to our tensor network notation. Okay, now I have an object which is a blob, but now it's a blob I mean, very weird form, this green thing, and many legs, all these legs. So, and as many legs, as boundary legs have the region R. So this is just an element with our tensor network notation, an element in C to the D tensor, the size of the boundary of the region. That's it. 
Okay, nothing else. And now I'm going to construct a state, so an element in CD tensor, the, the size of the region, in the region, but only in the region. And with the graphical notation, it's very simple. What I do is I put the tensors that define the peps in the region. I have all these legs outside, which are in principle open. And then I close this with this boundary condition. I contract, I join all those legs. So I join the legs of this with the legs that come out of this region by this procedure of jo joining legs. And then this is an object here. Is it clear with this tensor number notation what I'm doing? Should I write it here, maybe in two steps? So that's the bad thing of the slides. But okay, so so I in I have a region, no? Let's say four by four to make it simpler. With my purple. So this is my region. Okay? This is R. This tensor lives where? This lives in CD tensor 4, tensor CD tensor, the size of the boundary of the region. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Right? Okay? Now I have another tensor, which is a strange blob like that, that has this. No? This is this green thing there, no? And this lives in CD times the boundary of the region. Okay? This is this green thing here. And now I put here, together with that, and join the legs. I join this leg with this leg. This leg with this leg. Okay? With the process of joining legs. Which in this case, it's just nothing as taking this as the dual of that and doing just the usual duality transformation. There's nothing more, but okay, it's, this is what we are doing, okay? Yes. It, it, it is clear, no? We are doing just the process for joining legs. So essentially, this maps a possible boundary condition for this region because now this region, we, we need to put a boundary to kill this extra Degrees of freedom that are not physical, these are virtual. This is not the physical degree of freedom, is this D. So we have to kill them. So we could choose periodic boundary conditions, but no, now we, we take a particular fixed boundary condition. There's a way to fix these indices by some coefficients, and this fix these coefficients. That's what it is. So it's a map from boundary conditions to bulk. Okay. And this is gamma R. Good. Now we consider the range of that map. So the set of all states, so it's the set, the set of all states that you can generate here by changing different boundary conditions, by choosing all possible boundary conditions, so which is the set of states you can get. We call this GR. And then the Hamiltonian will be the projector onto the orthogonal space of that. This is the Hamiltonian, okay, for that region. The interaction for that region is that. So in particular, we know that the kernel of the Hamiltonian is exactly that space. Okay? So this defines the interaction for a particular region, which is this interaction in R, tensor identity in the rest. And by the very definition, apply to your original PEPs, this is zero. And the reason is very simple because the original PEPs, the original PEPs, acts as a possible boundary condition for that region. It was the, the idea. So essentially, we have that. And now, because I'm assuming translation of invariant in the PEPs, the Hamiltonian is just this single interaction translated through the system. Okay? The same in all translations. Because the PEP was traditional invariant, of course, the same. If this is true, the same is true for big H, so that's true. But look, 
these local terms are semi-definite positive. Of course, capital H is a sum of semi-definite positive objects. It's also semi-definite positive. And H in psi peps is zero. So definitely, psi peps is the ground state. Because if this is semi-definite positive, the smallest possible eigenvalue is zero. And this is an eigenvector of eigenvalue zero, is the ground state. Okay? Okay, so that's that. Moreover, it, H is what is called frustration free, meaning that the ground the ground state minimizes the energy not only globally, but also locally. So it minimizes the energy of each of these terms in the independently. Okay? Because it makes it zero for all of them. And what is called frustration free is that that the ground state minimizes the energy of each local interaction independently. Okay, so that's the that's the parent Hamiltonian construction. Okay, so then the questions is okay, when is this ground state unique? And when is the Hamiltonian gapped? Okay, so for the first question, we we call, we say that the PEPS is normal if there exists some region R such that this map, gamma R, that maps boundary conditions to bulk states is injective as a linear map. Okay? So the usual notion of injective, no? Um, so that essentially different boundary conditions go to different states. Okay, so that's... Okay, so as I said, different boundary conditions go to different states. And then such R is called an injective region. Okay, good. So, so after blocking, we can assume with a lo loss of objectivity that R is one side. Okay, because we can just do some steps of blocking. Uh, and then until, if the, if the PEPs is normal, until, until R is one side, and then we call such PEP an injective PEPs. And then it's very simple to see, maybe it's easier in that, in that picture, that uh, a PEPs is injective if and only if these linear maps AV that I wrote before, these are injective. <coughs> are invertible, well, it's injective, it's obviously, yeah, injective. So invertible over the range. Are injective, okay, so that's, that's the reason. So we can invert them. Good. And then the theorem is that if the PEPs is injective, then it is the unique ground state of its parent Hamilton. Okay? That can be even taken nearest neighbor in this blocked regime. So essentially the interaction length of the Hamiltonian is this is the minimal size in which this gamma R is injective. Okay, because somehow no, I mean as I, said, as I said, if the PEPs is normal, I can block it to make it injective. If it's injective, the parent Hamiltonian in, in the nearest neighbor case has its a unique ground state. So the interaction length is essentially the order of the size of the injective region, the smallest injective region. In 1D, also the parent Hamiltonian is gapped. This was proven already in this paper by Fanen Master Galean Berner in 1992. Okay, so some important remarks. In two dimensions, the gap question is, is a major one in the sense that uh, it's not true, as in one did, that injective implies gap. So we, we have counterexamples. But even more, we recently show that even proving uh, the gap for the part Hamiltonian of a two dimensional PEPs is undecidable. So even that is hard, okay? So, so it's a hard question. Uh, again, for particular cases, we can show it and we will do that, but, but in general, it's hard. So, and as I say, if, if a PEP is normal, how big is the smallest injective region uh, of that PEP? Because this is essentially, this gives a bound on the interaction length so of the of the of the Hamiltonian. So how many particles this local interaction should involve? Okay, so that's the interaction length. Okay, so in 1D, 
there is something called a quantum bilan theorem uh, that did Mikkel proved probably during your PhD could, could be or uh, but this is the optimal version okay the, this this original bounds of, of, of Mikkel were a bit worse but okay this is the best known bound shows that if we have a um, normal so this is in 1d ah, I say this is in 1d uh, the size of this smallest injective region grows only like d squared log d where d is the bond dimension so that's very nice it's not known. It's known that it must grow at least like d squared. Le the log d is not clear. It's optimal up to log d. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and in 2D, the only thing that is known, as far as I know so far, is that this inject injective region depends only on d. So it does not depend on the particular tensor you choose, on the coefficients, only on the one dimension. But this function, there is no bound on it. In, in principle, it could be even uncomputable. Okay, so this is a big open question whether there is a, at least a computable bound, even if it's exponential or double exponential, uh, that, the, that bounds these injective regions. This is, as far as I know, it's open. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say related to, I think, no? Just related to that first inclusion. Any summarizing? Yeah, PEPs are ground states of local interacting Hamiltonians. Okay, whether the gap is a difficult question there. Um, but there is this panel Hamiltonian construction that guarantees that at least this PEPs is the ground state of a local interacting Hamiltonian. And then, okay, the properties, which is the interaction length of that Hamiltonian, if it's gapped or not, these are. In, in general, hard problems, but okay, this is what is known. In 1D, everything is nice. Uh, now, the other inclusion, but before, any questions about this construction, about this? Okay. Um, nice. So let's go to the other. Okay, sorry, before that, yes, so. Ah. Exactly, so what is known? So before going into the approximate case, uh, let me say something that also only works in 1D that gives an exact result. It's a very nice result of Takumatsui, very old from 1998. So, the, okay, of course, I will fill in the gaps now, but essentially um, we will show that the ground state of some type of one dimensional Hamiltonians has exact matrix product states as ground states. So, exact uniform MPS, by uniform MPS, I mean one-dimensional relationally invariant PEPs. Okay? So uniform mean, mean that all these tensors are the same. Okay. So the hypotheses are the Hamiltonian must be relationally invariant, because if you are going to have a ground state which is relationally invariant, better the Hamiltonian is. Frustration free, as those as the parent Hamiltonians are. Gapped, of course must have a unique ground state in the thermodynamic limit in a proper way that one can define, that I will not define now. And if I take the Hamiltonian with what is called with open boundary conditions, meaning that if I take a, a line, everything is in 1D. Imagine I have a nearest neighbor Hamiltonian. So they have a sum of a term here, with 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 a term here. And it, if I do that, I have other spins here, but if I stop in these interactions, this is called open boundary conditions, meaning that I consider only the interactions given a region that involve elements with are within that region. For instance, I, I will not consider the interaction from here to here. So this is with open boundary conditions. With periodic boundary conditions, I would include the interaction between D, this and that. If I don't, this is called open boundary conditions. Even if you have a unique ground state with periodic boundary conditions and a unique ground state in the thermodynamic limit, it could be, and in many cases it happens, that with open boundary conditions you have degeneracies. And the degeneracies come from the fact that the, intera the interactions involving the boundaries are not all of them there. There are only those that are inside. The outside are not there. And this gives extra freedom to have ground states. Okay. Uh, 
But then the hypothesis that this is totally okay, as long as the degeneracy with upper boundary condition is bounded uniformly with the size of this result. <laughs> okay? That simply does not grow to infinity. With all these properties, the ground state is an exact matrix plot state. Okay, there is another theorem, which is also very nice, um, uh, which okay, I probably uh, I give the credit to Yoshiko Gata, but this is, is based on works by, by other people. And uh, she showed that without any hypothesis in 1D, the ground state of a gap Hamiltonian, which is traditional invariant, is an exact matrix product state, but with infinite bond dimension, meaning when this, this D is infinite. And for one D, one can define it rigorously in a nice way. Okay? Um, and this is very relevant because she used this construction to solve a lot of outstanding open problems in mathematical physics in one dimension, in particular to give a formal uh, proof of the, this, uh, symmetry, uh, the system of the symmetry protective topological orders in 1D, I mean, on the classification of symmetry protective topological order in 1D, something. Uh, uh, and for that, she got the, the, the uh, Henry Poincare Prize in the last ICMP. So, um, and the, the key insight is exactly that that, that, that in one dimensional gap, uh, Hamiltonians, the ground state is an exact matrix for the state, an exact perhaps with infinite bond dimension, uh, but in 1D, one can really work properly with that object, even if it's infinite dimensional. That's, that's nice. That, that's, that's, that's a nice result, but okay, that's a bit off. I'm getting a bit off now. But okay. okay, what about approximation results? Okay, so, so let's start with 1D and take the non-uniform case. In, I, I allow each tensor in the vertex to be different. Okay? Capital D is, as always, the, 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 the dimension of this edge, so this C to the D, and let me call N the number of sites in my, in my, in my one-dimensional system. And I would like this to be epsilon close to the real, to the actual ground state. And the question is how D should a scale with epsilon and n? So that's the question. Okay? So which is the how d should a scale as a function of epsilon and n? Okay, so the state of the art is this theorem by Itayarat and co-authors in uh, 13. In, they show that it's enough to grow this d sublinearly. Okay, so it's an exponential, but don't be fooled because here is a log to a power which is power less than one. Okay, so this is sublinear. It's smaller than linear. Okay, and he showed that if you take d growing sublinearly with n like that, where gamma is the gap, then this error decreases polynomially with n. So it can be even can be can go to zero even polynomially with n. Okay. So then, this is a, a very strong approximation result. It's enough to take D sublinear, okay, with the system size. Good. So that's the result. So what happens in the case of translational invariant cases? And now, uh, this is a very nice result by Wang, and this is another paper by Suhan Verstete uh, that proved the same thing independently. But this is, in a sense, a corollary of the previous result. So if we are, usually one is interested on local observables, so observables that act on some part of the bulk of the system, because it's what people really can measure. Let's say, so let's take L sites, and we like to understand, uh, since we are going to measure on these L sites, all we care about is the reduced density matrix, the reduced state on these L sites. Okay. And then, so we would like to approximate the reduced state on these L sites of the actual ground state by the reduced state on this L site of some matrix product state. And get an error of epsilon because this is the error that will enter in the expectation value of observables, as we showed. Uh, okay, this is in one norm, of course, as we showed yesterday. Okay, so they show that it's enough to take 
the bond dimension d of the order l over epsilon. And the nice thing is that the system side does not enter here. Okay? So this only depends on the number of sides you want to measure and the error. Okay? In a nice way. So this linearly with the inverse of the error and with f. So but this independent of the system size, that's very relevant. Okay. So that's the same thing. Okay, good. Okay, there is a subtlety for experts. Indeed, this is not a matrix product state, this is what is called a matrix product operator. But okay, whatever. It's not really a, it's a, essentially the same thing. Okay, now 2D. Uh, again, I'm writing just the state of the art. I forgot to say that the first result of approximation by matrix product states is due to Matt Hastings uh, in 2007, maybe. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm giving just optimal results. And the same 2D, the best result, so the first result is, was also due to Matt Hastings in 2006, uh, but I'm giving now the state of the art, which are results after that. Okay, so, but, okay, so this is a paper from well, now 10 years ago by Andras Moldar and co-authors, and they first approximate the thermal state of a Hamiltonian that I have commented several times, but I didn't write, is that object there. So if I have a Hamiltonian, it appears in several of the comments, so if H is a Hamiltonian, then um, beta is the inverse of the temperature. And okay, there are things like Boltzmann constants and whatever, but everything is absorbed on beta. Um, so, or on H, so essentially, the thermal uh, state is this state normalized, so divided by the trace of that object. So this is called the thermal state of H. And it's in principle, if I fix the temperature to 1 over beta, uh, this is the uh, state in which the system, uh, uh, which the system thermalizes, so the, if we wait long enough, the state will be in that state. So the, st the state of the system will be that, that state. So precisely because of that, because these are stable states at fixed temperatures, uh, these are very relevant because these are the states that essentially appear in nature, and this is why people want to construct these things or measure, I mean, or say, obtain ways to approximate the result of measures on that on that states and things like that. And that's why constructing thermal states is not is maybe as interesting as constructing constructing uh, ground states. On top of that, if we do if we take the temperature going to zero, the thermal state converges to the ground state. So these also are approximations to the ground state. It's something that already appears yesterday. I think in the question of if you would like to write a Limbladian whose fixed point is a ground state, that can be hard because this is not full rank. And some other techniques require full ranks, but one can say, okay, take a small temperature and construct this state. If the temperature is small enough, this is close enough to the to the ground state. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, so so this gives approximation of these thermal states by PEPs. Okay, PEPs are for pure states, but there is an analog construction for mixed states for density operators, uh, which is essentially the same thing. And they are called PEPO, okay? <laughs> Simply, instead of a state operator, no? Projective entangled pair operator, but essentially same idea. Uh, so again, they show that in order to get this error epsilon, the bond dimension should scale for fixed temperature, okay? But it scales very bad with temperature in the sense that temperature is in the, okay, beta is in the exponent. Okay, so for fixed beta, this is polynomial in N and 1 over epsilon, but it scales very badly with beta. Yes. So in this result that you're giving here, again, the Hamiltonian is a relational invariant. Yes, yes. But yes, how yes, they yes. build these things, is, uh, or instead they give at the end, it's non uniform it's not a... Uh, what? You have here, they are non uniform uh, No, I think, I think they, they, they don't need to do the relational invariant, no, no, but local. It's important it's local. No, no, what I mean, what do you mean by this non-uniform? Exactly. Ah, no, that is not a relational invariant. Ah, that is not necessarily H to be, if H is a relational invariant? No, this construction, the PEPO is, is the, it, 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 it's tensor is different. 
Non-uniform is non translation invariant, it's the same. Exactly, so that, but H, H, H doesn't need to be translation invariant either. Yeah, but it, it is, in the way they prove this thing, is non-uniform. It's also non-uniform, yes, 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 yes. Even if it is translation invariant, this is not. Uh, but it's easy to see that if this is traditional invariant, to and this is not, the price to pay to make it to make it traditional invariant is case linear with the size of the system. So this you can get for free always by paying a price of multiplying by another n, which in any case for this case is not that big a big deal. <laughs> okay, so that yes. Maximally mixed state is actually bone dimension zero. Bone dimension one, one. yes, yes, yes. 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 Okay. Yes. okay. It's a it's a protest state. I mean, yes, yes. This kind of stability yeah, yes. comes to the from the size of the edges in order to get yes. the error. Um, is is there some uh, typical variational estimate which is involved? Or I mean, I I, can, I I did. I will show in the end an idea of the type of proofs at least uh, behind. The 1D case. Uh, this uh, a keyword is approximate ground state projector. Approximate, what is called approximate ground state projector. Approximate ground state projector. That's the keyword. And I will show the first such thing that appeared that gives. <coughs> weak bounds, but some bounds that are not trivial, which is called the detectability lemma. This is one such AGSP, but not the best one. Uh, I will show you in a second. I will, I, will show, I, will show, I will show this, which exactly is a particular case, but I will do that, I will do that. Will do that. If I have time, I can, I can even prove that. Yes, we could. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I will, I will. Just wait a second. I will, I will. Uh, right now, essentially. Two slides after that. So, any any other question? Okay, so. And then, again, one can take the temperature go to zero, or beta to infinity. And then, if, if the Hamiltonian has nice extra properties, then, I can get a nice approximation of the ground state. And, and the reason is I need properties to guarantee that the thermal state is close enough to the ground state for sufficiently high temperature. <laughs> okay, that's the thing. So the hypothesis I need in the Hamiltonian is that the number of eigenstates, so that the eigenstate somehow do not concentrate close to the ground state, that if I if I fix an energy k, for this energy k fixed, I grow the system size n. And I count how many eigenstates are below k as a function of the system size. If this grows at most polynomially with n, then I'm happy. And this is expectable because essentially it's expectable that the tails are polynomial, and this is the tail of the of the of the densities. 2D, 2D, 2D. This is 2D. When did you don't need that because gap is enough? Yeah. So this is because there is no proof only involving the gap. So actually, with this extra hypothesis, which is more than the gap, it's enough to take the bond dimension e to the log square, which okay is not polynomial, it's super polynomial, but okay, it's not that bad. Okay, so that's and that's the state of the art for the ground state. This is for the ground state now in two D. Oh, in, in this, in any D. When I say 2, is 2 or higher. Okay. So all these results that they put for 2 are true for 3, 4, 5, whatever they mention. Okay. Okay. Now, your question. <laughs> now, the idea of the proof. So the idea I will is this uh, approximate state projectors, and I will do with the, I mean, this was kind of the, what is called a detectability lemma. And indeed, this is used a lot, not for this, but for many other things. Um, OK, <laughs> the proof is, OK, the original proof was rather complicated, but there is currently a very 
simple and elegant proof that I can even do at the end of the lecture in the afternoon if, if I have time. But okay, don't be, it's not, I mean, it's less scary as it looks. So, so take a sequence of projectors, meaning always self adjoint projectors. Okay? And take the Hamiltonian, the sum of, of those things. So assume that the Hamiltonian is the sum of self adjoint projectors. This is a big <coughs> hypothesis, but sometimes it's not. Okay? Because sometimes it's enough to reduce to this type of Hamilton. This, this type of Hamiltonians, but okay, for, for now, let's, let's assume that. For instance, the parent Hamiltonians of PEPs are of this form, for instance, okay, so that's, that's okay. But okay. So take a set of projectors, take the Hamiltonian, which is the sum of those. And now assume that this QI commutes with all but a few others. And look, for instance, if we have, imagine that we have a two-dimensional Hamiltonian, Or even a 1D is simple, but the same happens. Okay, in 2D even is a 2D. You take a 2D. So imagine that we have a, our 2D lattice, and we have a Hamiltonian which is uh, nearest neighbors. So meaning that the interactions are this with that, this with that, this with that, etc. No? So these are all interactions. So if I have one interaction which is this one, with how many other interactions it does not commute? Only with this, 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 and that. Because all the others, for instance, this one, they act on totally different Hilbert spaces, so they commute. Okay? So, in all these geometrically interacting Hamiltonians, no matter if it's 1D or 2D, this G here is always finite. Okay? So that's simply take, for instance, in 1D for nearest neighbors, this is 2. But in 2D is whatever I count as 6, no, or something, okay, but, but it's finite, okay, so. Okay. And, but this depends on the dimension, if it's 1D, 2D, 3D, okay, but it's fixed. This projector has the same encoding locality. Sorry? This projector encodes locality in a sense. Sure, 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 okay, because, because this the structure is, is by definition, Hamiltonian is always going to be the sum of the sure, 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 okay, times. This is more general. This doesn't. Imp this is true like that without any locality. But since we, we are going to apply to local Hamiltonians, we can have in mind that this this will be a local Hamiltonian, and therefore naturally this will be fulfilled with a G that only depends on the dimension, whether one in one D or two D. But in this statement, there is no locality or whatsoever. It's nothing. But in particular, for local Hamiltonians, it's true. Now, let's put this way. Now we take a state psi, and now we take, okay, the. So let, let's 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 assume that we are interested in log like like a parent Hamiltonian of a PEPS or a matrix potential. So Hamiltonian which is frustration free and local. Okay, like, like one of like the parent Hamiltonian of a PEPS, like the parent Hamiltonian, like a parent Hamiltonian. Maybe it's the. Then these objects annihilate the ground state. Okay, because frustration free. So identity minus QI stabilizes the ground state. So leaves the ground state invariant. No? Because it's the orthogonal. Okay. Okay, so if the ground state is unique and I put here the ground state, nothing happens. Now I, I put any other state, but I should think of putting here something which is orthogonal to the ground state. And now what I do is I apply all these projectors sequentially. And the order is irrelevant, because they, they don't commute. But what I, the claim is independent of the order, well, for any order. Now, take the Imagine that this is the, something orthogonal to the ground state. Apply this projector sequentially. And now, see how the norm decreases. So we give an estimate of how the norm decreases. And the estimate is given in terms of this constant g and in terms of the energy of that state, 
of that state. Okay? Uh, or that state or of psi? Uh, no, I doubt. It's probably no phi, I think. Okay, the energy of the state, exactly. Um, exactly, exactly. Good. Um, exactly. Then, what happens? So, what will happen is that if there is a gap, this energy will be at least the gap. So, the gamma energy is zero, and this energy will be at least the gap. This will, will happen. Exactly. So, um, let me. So, this, what I wrote here, I will go back to that, is what I'm saying with words. But then the corollary, I will write down now exactly uh, the one case, but the corollary is if I take something orthogonal to the ground state, the action of these projectors. What is, called, what is called the detectability lemma operator, decreases the norm as 1 over gap over g squared plus 1. That's the, that's the, the result. And now, which is the detectability lemma operator, is exactly, I take my Hamiltonian, which is frustration-free, made out of projectors, and I have this identity minus QI, and let's assume it's, I'm in 1D. So in 1D, essentially, I can write things all these terms in two layers. So if they are, they are nearest neighbors, so I, the, the interaction which is one and two, three and four, five and six, etc., in the first layer, and they commute. No, this is this, tensor this, tensor this, tensor this, and then this is this, this, and that. And then I multiply all these things together in this order. So first, the first layer, and then the second layer. So it's the product in the layers, of the product in each layer. And within each layer, everything commute. In 1D, there are just two layers. So this, I choose this particular order. Okay? And this is what they call this detectability lemma operator. Because the Hamiltonian is frustration free, as I said, the detectability lemma leaves the ground state invariant. And of course, the norm is less than one because, I mean, all of them are a product of projectors. And then the detectability lemma gives me this corollary. So this tells me that if I have something orthogonal to the ground state, this is a contraction. So in the, in the set, in the orthogonal subspace to the ground state, this is a contraction of norm bounded by that. This is what this says. So if I iterate this detectability lemma several times, this goes exponentially to zero. And this is why this is called an approximate ground state projector. Because it projects onto the ground state. It leaves the ground state invariant. And anything orthogonal is mapped to zero exponentially fast. So this is a particular case of this that works for frustration-free Hamiltonians. So there are others that work in general. Okay, but that's, that's okay, so that's... Uh, now... Now, let me just, in these three minutes, sorry. So uh, this is, as, uh, I just rewrote what, what is there. I think there's a square missing, by the way. Here, there should be a square. Uh, so there's a square missing here that explains this square root. Uh, so if now I take powers of the detectability lemma operator, as I said, in operator norm, the projector onto the ground state minus the detectability lemma operator to the power L in operator norm, decreases exponentially to zero with L, with the power. This is just trivial corollary of this corollary, which is a trivial corollary of the detectability lemma. Okay? Because simply everything in the orthogonal goes to zero at a constant rate. Again, there is a square missing here. There should be a square root here. Okay, so... So let me now show how this already gives an approximation by a matrix product state, by a PEPS of the ground state, okay? In this, in this one minute. So take, we know that the, imagine that the ground state is unique. Then the projector onto the ground state is just this object, no? the, the rank one projector onto the ground state. And now we take an L so that this error is epsilon. No? 
The cell, of course, is logarithmic. And now I write this detectability lemma to the power L is several layers, no? It's, it's the detectability lemma is two layers. Now it will be two, another two, another two, another two, another two, okay? Okay, let me write only three, but there are several. Now, okay, believe me, this is a matrix product operator of one dimension exponential with the number of L. This is trivial. Okay, maybe people that are familiar with tensor network will see immediately. Believe me, essentially, you do, for each one of these tensors, you do a singular variable composition between the legs in the left and the legs in the right. And then, okay, then one can see that the, in any cut um, between a number of sides and the next, the Smith rank is bounded by, essentially, something which grows exponentially with the number of layers. It's, it's, it's very, believe me, it's simple to see. This is not the, the issue. So this is a matrix product operator, a matrix product state, if you want, but with indices, because an operator going down and up, like, like a matrix product state, with one dimension which is exponential with L. But then, of course, the two exponentials compensate, <coughs> and then uh, the bond dimension is exactly 1 over epsilon to the power beta over alpha, where beta is the, this element in the exponent here, alpha the element in this exponent here, which is a polynomial in 1 over epsilon. So essentially this gives an approximation by a matrix product state of this ground state of polynomial bond dimension. Okay. Bad thing is, is in a very bad norm. I'm approximating in operator norm. Okay. And I want to approximate in trace norm. One can do that, of course, to approximate in trace norm, but one has to work much harder for that. This simply shows that already this gives an idea why there, there should be an approximation by a matrix product state. But this is not the final theorem. Okay? It's simply just to give an idea of what is behind. But this is the philosophy, is to find this sort of approximate ground state projectors that fix the ground state and all the rest vanish to zero very fast. While keeping a nice matrix product state form like, like this one. But that's, that's the, the idea. Okay, and with that, I finish. Sorry for being a bit late. And we continue in the afternoon. Thank you.